to the book of John. John chapter 20. We'll pick up where we left off this morning. Reading here in the first ten verses, I will say the first eight. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciples, the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying and yet went in, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise You and exalt You and thank You for Your love, for Your grace, for Your mercy, for all that You've bestowed upon us, Lord. We thank You for even the freedoms to gather here this morning and to worship You. Lord, I pray that in this moment that you'll set everything aside in our minds. Lord, I pray that if there be someone in this building this morning lost and on their way to hell, Lord, that you send the Spirit and do the work that only you can do. We give thanks to you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. I read a story about a family who lived next to a cemetery and every day they would drive past this cemetery. Well, one day as they were driving by the cemetery, the man's young daughter said to her father, Dad, who lives there? And before he could respond, his brother, her brother Timothy spoke out and said, Jana, nobody lives there. This is where people go when they die. And the young girl quickly responded, well, then they live there. And then she asked her father, Daddy, Daddy, will they live there forever? And the dad quickly responded, no, honey, one day they will rise again. Several months had passed and they were on a bike ride together and the father was pulling Jana in a little buggy behind the bike. And as they were going down the road, little Jana was just taking in the sights. It was a beautiful day. She was looking at all the flowers and everything and out of nowhere, she started screaming, Daddy, they're alive! Daddy, they're alive! And the dad almost wrecked the bicycle. And as he began to stop, he looked left and right and he asked his daughter, Jana, what are you talking about? She said, look, they've risen from the grave. And it happened to be Memorial Day, and people were gathered at the cemetery. You know, for little Jana, it was Resurrection Day. Now, for her, she believed this is the day when everyone was coming out of the grave. It was excitement. It was joy that this day had actually came to life. Well, the security of such a thought has been brought to us here in the text of John chapter 20. The reason we even know that there's a day coming where we can be risen from the grave. The only reason that we could ever have this kind of excitement is because Christ first arose from the grave. If we can't believe what is said here in John chapter 20, then it means that we cannot trust Christ. And if we cannot trust Christ, it means that Christ is not 
God indeed, but if Christ be risen, it means that everything that Christ said in his earthly ministry is true. That he indeed was the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And he indeed died on the cross. And there the blood that was shed on there, that for, for the whosoever will, would be saved. And also, if what he said is true, then three days and three nights will he spend in this borrowed tomb. This is not just some story that we tell. This is not just some kind of event we celebrate in this world. I know some people say this is a very pagan day. And, and to draw people in on such a day makes you very pagan. My mind is this about this is that this here is somewhat, I understand what people are saying, but this is a special day to the believer. It is Resurrection Day. Do you realize what we have here that is so unique? Do you realize what we have here that is so special? We talked about it in the morning service. Over 4,200 religions in the world. And there is only one religion that claims that there's an empty tomb. If you go to Buddha's grave, you find Buddha. You go to Muhammad's grave, you find Muhammad. You go to the Dalai Lama's grave, you find the Dalai Lama. But here in John chapter 20, on the first day of the week, we find the empty tomb. Now, Friday, I was running around town trying to find myself some dry ice. As we were preparing to go down to Lexington, and as I was down there at the company here in our neighborhood, uh, the man, we began to talk back and forth about the Word of God. We began to talk back and forth about preaching and about this day that was coming upon us. And as he began to talk to me about this day, he was to let me know that, listen, I know you have a special service, but what you really need to do is you need to come to my church because my church does it right. My church tells it correctly. Listen, we have all the phones. We have all the smoke machines. We have all the lights. We have all the effects that you ever need to tell this story correctly. But you know what? I don't need light smoke. I don't need Mel Gibson to tell this story for me. I don't even care how the world, how the, this new TV series Chosen plays this out. The greatest place this story could ever be told is what the Bible tells us here in John chapter 20. He is not in the grave, but he has risen. For those who missed it this morning, this morning we started talking about Mary. And we've seen in the very beginning of this text how much Mary loved the Lord. And how excited she was to worship the Lord. We discussed and come to the conclusion that Mary arrived at this bottle tomb to pour out this spices and this incense upon our Lord. And the conclusion would be that Mary is willing to do more for a dead Christ than many believers today are willing to do for a risen Christ. We have no desire to sacrifice of our time. We have no desire to sacrifice of our efforts. We are unwilling, and it seems that we have a lack of desire to give our all to this risen Christ. We seen that she was so excited when she arrived at this empty tomb. She arrived here, the stone was rolled away, and she ran away, but the problem was, in the midst of all of her excitement, she had a faulty story. Listen, if you be here this morning and you live, leave with any other conclusion. That must be risen. That God hath, the Father hath raised him from the dead. You have not faithfully reviewed this 
evidence that we are presented with this morning. Paul said, if Christ be not risen, then all of our faith is in vain. Not only does she have a faulty conclusion, but she takes this faulty conclusion to these disciples who are already estranged. These disciples who are already brokenhearted, who are already heavy at heart over losing the Savior. She summarized the foolish conclusion that Christ was stolen, not that he had been risen. This morning we take off here in verse number three. She's given this conclusion that somebody has stolen the risen Christ. That someone had came in the, might, in the middle of the night and had taken him away. How could this possibly be true? After hearing this report, the Bible says, Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher, so they ran both together. When they hear this conclusion, the only thing that they know for certain is they need to see this with their own eyes. They need to inspect the evidence that is put before them. Whether you understand this or not, even as you leave here this morning, as we work through this text briefly, I promise I'll have you out of here soon. But listen, you will be forced to look at the evidence and come to a conclusion. Conclusion. Is Christ risen? Is Christ risen? So Peter and John, these two church leaders, who one day, who will one day preach with great resurrecting power, who will one day preach with great passion. I mean, soon, remember the day of Pentecost, Peter would stand before them and say, ye men, that, that Jesus whom thou hast slain, God hath risen from the grave. But here on this morning, we have a doubting Peter. Here on this morning, we have a confused Peter. You may say, well, listen, I understand that they were confused, but how do I get from here? How do I get from a doubter to a man who is filled with passion for Christ? How do I get from a, a woman who's lacking faithfulness to the Lord to a woman who's sold out for Christ? Peter and John were much like the Bereans over in Acts chapter 17. Well, when they heard the evidence, they investigated what was said. Peter reportedly outran John. Some say this is because Peter is older. I have heard others say it's because uh, Peter was out of fellowship with the Lord. And when you're out of fellowship with the Lord, you always run slower to him. Certainly Peter was out of fellowship, but you can see this scene that's laid out here before us. Two grown men running to see what happened to the Savior. And in stooping down, and as John looked into the tomb, he was taking him in, and there arrives Peter. And you can just see Peter, as you know, his personality bursting into the tomb. What will be their conclusion? What will the evidence point to? Do you recognize this morning that the Word of God invites every skeptic to it? Investigate it. Search these truths. Sift through the evidence that the Word of God gives us and see what your conclusion is. Why? How could Peter and John arrive here in these few verses and sift the evidence and come to a conclusion where we get to the end of verse 8 and it says, and he saw these evidences and believed. You know, the scientists, they take in different things and then they develop a theory. The historian takes in different facts and then presents truth. But listen, this book for us, it's not a book of literature. It's not a book of no novels. It is a book that gives us the answers to death. It is a book that gives us the answers to life. It is a book that explains our existence. Did you know that history bears record that a man named Jesus invaded history, secular writings, that a man named Jesus invaded history 
and did many mighty miracles in which men were unable to explain. Did you know that this man named Jesus impacted history so much that he literally divided time in half? He changed the entire course of history in 33 years. And all of history is recorded that he not only lived, but a secular history records that this man named Jesus Christ died. Not only, does it, not only does it record that he died, but secular history records that he was placed in a tomb. And secular history also records that three days after being put in this tomb, he came up missing. See, the truth that is presented here in John chapter 20 is a truth that can not only be supported scripturally, the Bible is only here for you to fill in the gaps. But the historical evidence is still here for us. You must understand, I know that we talked about this morning, many people like to come and arrive here that there's this swoon theory that Christ didn't really die on Calvary. That actually he just fainted and when he was placed in this cold tomb that he was risen again. That he was brought back to life. That he woke up in this situation and escaped the tomb. See, Peter and John would never even think such a thing. You know why? Because they understood the Romans. They understood that the Romans were the masters of death. The Romans knew exactly how to torture. The Romans would never conclude that someone was dead that was not dead. And the Bible bears witness that when they arrived at the man in the middle, he was dead. And for further verification, the Bible says that they took the spear and pierced our Lord's side. And forth with what? Came blood and water. He, he was dead. He was really dead, and he was placed in this ball tomb. And listen, and as they arrived and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple. Well, what's the evidence? Where is Christ? You see, the evidence that Peter and John see when they arrive here at the tomb, the first thing that let them know that something is going on is that there was a moved barrier. The barrier was moved not so that Jesus could get out, but so that we could see in. This moved barrier was no small barrier. This great stone that was rolled away, how do we even get this idea that it's even a great stone? Because when we read in the other synoptic gospels, when they arrived at the tomb, the four ladies were wondering how they was ever going to get the stone rolled away. This was a massive stone. Not only was there a moved barrier, but when Peter and John arrived here, they was deeply confused because the guarded scene had been changed. Remember, when Jesus was placed inside of this tomb, there were Roman guards put outside of the tomb to guard it. But the guards are gone. Matter of fact, when these, we know when Christ was risen from the dead, we read in other, the other Gospels that the, these two Roman guards, they would run and then they would confess. The one said, surely he is the son of God. But yet here, when Peter and John arrive, they say, the guards are missing. The, the stone is moved away. Now, we also see not only the guards are missing, not only is the stone rolled away, but listen, it was a sealed tomb. It was a, a tomb that was sealed by the highest authority in the land saying, you will not roll this stone open. Remember what they're looking for here. 
the, 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 the Jews are looking for a king. The Jews are looking for the Messiah. This one who is going to deliver Israel. They arrived here. And I could just imagine this when they get there. Not only is the stone rolled away, not only is the Roman guards gone, but they can see the insignia, this wax insignia laying on the ground. Letting them know that someone with the highest authority in the land rolled that stone away. Not only was there this sealed tomb, but the grave reality that there was a missing body. Where have they laid our Lord? Not only was his body missing, but guess what else was part of the evidence? There was some leftover material. Yeah, the grave clothes were laying inside the tomb. Imagine this. Many people believe that if you was to paint this image in your mind, it was to say that you would literally maybe take a wrapping, this, this wadding, this waddling, this linen, and wrap it around a balloon and then poke the balloon and watch it deflate, yet it still remains some of the shape. Listen, when they came down into the tomb, when Peter and John came down in here and surveyed the evidence, it was like what was inside the wrappings was gone. Because that's exactly what it was. Well, you know, this could have been looters. Listen, if looters would have invaded a tomb to loot, they would have tore up the linens, trying to get to the jewelry underneath the linens. But that was not the case. This wasn't looters. This wasn't any of that. I mean, think about this. No one would ever come and steal a body in this manner. The, it's said that the Egyptians during this time, they embalmed to help keep the odor down. The Greeks and the Romans, you know what they did? They cremated. But here, these people, what they would do is they would take these they would take these wrappings and dip them in different spices and different odors and different instances and wrap it around the body. No one would evade a tube three days later and leave the linens behind and grab a stinking body. Naked. Nobody would do that. Ever. So they see this evidence, this, these clothes remaining behind. And then they look over and see this away from where the body was laying above our Lord and Savior, or, or, or away from where he was wrapped up and placed, off to the side, in a separate place, the Bible says the napkin that was around his head was not there, but laid in a total separate place, folded up. Now, some say, according to Jewish tradition, that if you was eating in a home, and you enjoyed the time, and you enjoyed the meal, and you had every, uh, every desire of returning, that when you left, instead of just tossing your napkin on the plate, that you would fold it and set it on the plate, letting them know that I enjoyed it, and I would soon return. If this be the case, then hallelujah. Because what he's saying here to us, this is the evidence. This situation, these grave clothes, this stone, this insignia being broken, the missing Roman soldiers, all of this was enough evidence to John to make him say, something is going on here. The one who is in here kind of left us a signal that, hey, He's coming back. For Mary at first sight, she left panicked. When Peter arrived, he found himself confused. When John surveyed the evidence, the Bible says he believed. And so it is for each and every one of us this morning. Know this, that just because you survey the evidence... Does it mean that if you do not believe, you've discredited facts? It means you found yourself in an area, in a situation condemned. Now, this is not something you take glory in, but I've never found glory in telling people the truth when it says, hey, that if you do not put your faith in Christ and you do not repent of your sins, that you're on your way to hell. But I do take joy in this, that if you repent of your sins, and that you place your faith in Jesus Christ, 
that no matter how bad it gets here, that no matter how terrible the situation, that because we have faith in the evidence, we have faith because we understand what Christ has done inside of us, because of that faith, no matter how bad it gets here, we're not staying here. The Bible says in John that they, there was these stages as he surveyed the evidence. In verse 5 it says that John looked in and he saw. This simply means that he seen something, that he was looking at the situation and beginning to take it in. In verse 6, it says that he see it. This means he began to look even closer. He began to investigate. That's what this word means. And in verse 8, again, the Bible says that he saw. And the word saw that's used here means that he saw with a perception, that he saw with an understanding. See, everything started making sense to John. The tubes empty, the grave clothes are here, the napkins over there are folded, somebody with high authority rolled the tomb back, the guards are gone. How could this ever be the case? I mean, do you know what would have happened to a Roman soldier if they would have fled the spot where they were called to command and be in charge of? John had understood that Christ has risen. Now, what I love about this text so much here, what I really enjoy when you read John's gospel is that we understand something principally. Now, all of us will say, you know, I would love to see the risen Christ in that moment when he came out of there. Oh, we love that. We love the thought process of, you know, seeing Christ during his earthly ministry. But I'm thankful for this text because some of us say, you know, I wish I was there with the ladies when the angels appeared unto them in that day and told them that Christ has risen. But I'm even more thankful for John. Because through the life of John and through what we see here, we come to an understanding that the evidence that is presented to us is enough to bring about faith in the resurrected Christ. You see, God doesn't always use supernatural methods of unveiling things to us unless it's needed. He supernaturally unveiled himself to these two gentlemen on the road of Emmaus. The angels unveiled himself, the angels unveiled themselves, I mean, explained the whole situation to these women. But for John, for John, when he read the evidence, the empty tomb, he began to think, you know what? Our Christ be risen. I, 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 our Christ be risen from the grave. What would you be willing to do this morning with the empty tomb? What does it cause your heart to do when you survey the evidence of the empty tomb? Does it cause you to wonder and say, listen, by the way, this will dramatically change these men's life. Remember, just in a few short chapters, if you go to the book of Acts, we learn about these men that did turn the world upside down. It's not a years and years space. No. What happened? They, they, they came to the belief and understanding in the resurrected Christ. They returned in the end, it says in verse 10, that they went back home, but they went back home with some encouraging facts. Christ be risen. They didn't run home with the same story that Mary was telling. The risen Christ appears, you know, as these two disciples journey. It's, what a resurrection day. That they go from one side of the spectrum, where their hearts are broken, to the reality of the resurrected Christ, and on the evening, evening of the resurrection day, the Bible says that the Lord appeared unto two men as they traveled on the road to Emmaus. And I, you know, I'm going to read it here just because 
It's the end of the resurrection day here. And I just want you to see how much the resurrection changed their hearts. I'm going to read it. Start in verse 13 of Luke 24. And behold, two of them that went, he told two of them, went that same day to the village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together all of these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near, drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walked and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto them, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? Hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us, went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the woman had said. But him they saw not. And he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? And the beginning at Moses and all the prophets he expounded unto them in all the scriptures and the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village, whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them, and it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke and gave it to them, and their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. But they said one to another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they arose the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathering gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is indeed risen and hath appeared. Simon. You, you want to really understand what it means here to have a risen Christ. These two men who were so broken, so down, because they had not yet understood what it meant to have a risen Savior. But when they finally grasped it, the Bible says, did it not burn within us when he reasoned to us the Scriptures? The Word of God became alive in them. It began to burn in them. And you know what happened? It emboldened them. You know what happened to the disciples, the apostles? They became martyrs. You know why they became martyrs? Because they were emboldened, and the word of God did burn within them. Why? Because Christ had risen. We leave out of here today, we have nothing to be ashamed of. We have nothing. What do you mean to mutter the words? Well, you know, I think sometimes we get ashamed of this with the gospel. We start preaching it to people. Well, you know, our, our Savior, he died on the cross for our sins. And 
Uh, and he died and he, and he rose again. He did what? Yeah, that's right. He rose again. There's no reason to stutter around this. Listen, these are truths that our faith is hinged upon. This is the main event for us. The atonement has already been paid on Calvary. And now, now we see the main event. Christ has now risen. What a hope. What a hope that we have that if Christ be risen, that we will be risen. That if Christ is risen, then our faith's not in vain. If Christ is risen, we can trust this word of God. You know what? Since Christ is risen, we can trust the word of God. Of God. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we give thanks to you for all that you've done, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the word of God that strengthens us, that encourages us. Lord, I pray that you embolden us, embolden us even this day, that we may go out, leave here this morning, proclaiming the truths of your word. Lord, thank you for all those who are here this morning. Lord, I pray if there be someone here in this building lost, that you do your work. In Jesus' name, amen.